for his presence and uh, uh, the kind of contribution he has made uh, to the field of education over his years of journey. We have among us today Mr. Vikas C. Sanyar, former specialist higher education, UNESCO Paris. Heartiest gratitude to you, sir, for being here. A warm welcome to Professor M. Anand Krishnan, former VC Anna University. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Kovar Shekhar Vijendra, Chancellor Shobhad University, Professor M. M. Pant, the founder of LMP Education Trust, Professor D. D. Sharma, and my co-chair Nipun Goenka, who is uh, the co-chair of the, the National Council of Education and he is the MD of the G. D. Goenka Group. Our greetings to members of the government, media, academia, industry and professional bodies present here today. Transformation of higher education has been in talks for almost a decade now, and I think uh, the thinking creative, thinking people management, number ten cognitive flexibility. After that, nobody does anything about it. We go back to the same stuff. Five years, this is an open piece of knowledge, and so on. So what we are doing is we are saying let's prepare ourselves for this and through teachers. So we are looking at program. Also, instead of this infrastructure and complexes and all kinds of things which everybody knows will never work. They seem very simple, mobile. Mobile is ubiquitous today. 5G is going to come. Prime Minister from the Red Fort says long distance education. I was delighted to hear distance education being spoken of from the Red Fort for the first time in the history of the country. If all that is being done, and I learned from it, he will learn about theory of machines and machines that make machines. <laughs> and I was really very impressed that it is true. And then I realized educators are learners who create other learners by building learning power. So these are the kind of things that we are trying to do. Very simple. Focus on learning, focus on knowledge, use the mobile phone, and make it a people's movement. Our tool for communication is WhatsApp which we have now perfected to a fair amount of art, we can program. We also have something called live WhatsApp. In fact, it is because of the GD Sharma that I'm here in person. So that most of my keynotes now are on WhatsApp live. I gave one for Lady to that college in Madurai. Recently, I did one for Jaipur. I did something for Rota and so on. And it's a perfect, and the beauty is that everything stays with you till you consciously delete it. So anyway, we are very delighted that whatever ought to be done, what is not being done, we are attempting to do, and we are looking at the teachers as a community. Last few words. This is driven by inspiration from several noble laureates. Because gave me the opportunity to hear Amart the same a couple of years ago in Habitat itself, and he pointed out there are two critical things, education and health. He said, we thought these were independent, we found education is the independent variable, health is the dependent variable, and therefore they focus on education. Elena Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, was the first woman to have won the Nobel Prize in Economics before Esther Vanet, and she had a very nice, interesting thing. Before her work, it was axiomatic, what Garrett Hardin has said, called the tragedy of the commons, that if something is held in commons and not managed by the government or authority or corporate, it will wither away. And Elena Rastrom got the Nobel Prize for proving that if a community properly manages it, it can be done very well. Today we know that one of the important agencies, infrastructure, means this IL and FS, infrastructure leasing and financial services which was responsible for our roads, transports, and others. That man has cheated us. He has been caught, he is robbing all the money, he's taking all the money from the banks, now we are in a bad situation, it's a very bad situation. So, but now it's just very bad, as you know. But please follow the news. So we will see what's going on in respect of this, all this problem the government has launched. Economic crisis. We have to talk about here. GDP has been forecast to be negative, very low now. It's about around 5%, but also the are turning into money in this. Negative growth is particularly manufacturing industries. But to know that there has been a good meeting with Gratka, with Gratka, right? On small manufacturing industries, as well as they have brought in the large corporate software to have a own program. Financial crisis. Now, Dr. Anson, we will talk about more about this financial crisis. We are running short of money, surely. 
but there is some way we have to refund the okay? Challenges from the inadequate use of or past natural. From here today, in Delhi, on a working day, to start a, an education summit and to have people from throughout the nation. It shows that groups are very deep. I must congratulate and thank you for your wonderful work. The topic of the summit for two days is transforming the higher education to meet future challenges. Do we know what are the challenges in future? It is a big question today in academia and industry everywhere. Because everything is changing so fast, what we feel is the challenge today may not be a challenge tomorrow. So maybe for the next summit, may I request Sharmaji to have one more summit in future with transforming educators and learners to meet future challenges. We have to transform the learners and educators more and especially when we look at the new education policy. It has brought so many important opportunities and challenges. Majority of the people if I, from the list, what I saw of the participants, the representation is from degree colleges, from the colleges, which is the most important part of our education ecosystem. We have the biggest ecosystem globally, I believe. So we need to see what are the challenges and uh, the core challenges we all know, I think the basic challenge, what I feel, is that we have to ask ourselves as an educator that how we can increase the learner's productivity. This is the basic question. And the approach shift has to be there because generally what we are doing, I teach what I know. From this approach, we have to go, I teach what you need. And new education policy gives us that flexibility sometimes. That, okay, let us ask what you need to learn. That learning approach has to be changed. Industry 4.0 has become a hubba. I'm using the word hubba. We all are afraid what will happen, and very nicely it was mentioned by Prasvan that nobody else will come to teach us what is industry 4.0 or anything. We have to learn it ourselves. So from WhatsApp to what is what's up. This has to happen here. What's up, that curiosity has to be there. Because if we look at industry 4.0, you all know better than me, from mechanization to electrification to automation. Then I put there 3.5 also, globalization, where we started shifting to lesser economy or where the workforce was cheaper to digitalization and industry 5.0 is going to be personalization. This is what even our new education policy speaks about where it says life skills, where it says that skills for the future, they have to be there and if I look at the education policy or education 4.0, if I look at so for me, education 1.0 was basic, how to be a good human being, from where we started. Then the second step was how to be a good worker. Then we had how to be a good executor. And now it is how to be a good creator. This is what we have to do. How we can create new things, new opportunities, new challenges. You can be addressed when we will have new opportunities with us. By 2020, we will have a labor surplus, 47%. I was not knowing this data, but when I was trying to find out that the US and the China both will have in minus, and we will have around 47% labor surplus. It means more challenges are there that our youth has to be accordingly trained that they get job globally, which we need to see and work. And this approach from basic core interdisciplinary to multidisciplinary where we are, this multidisciplinary approach has to be multidimensional also. We have to see that everything is not just focused on very small. And I am sure that under the 
leadership of uh, Professor G.D. Sharma seed will bring more innovative ideas, solutions, thought-provoking debates will be there that how we can really transform education, educators, learners for the future challenges. Thank you very much. I thank the speakers for sharing their thoughts. How delighted I am to be in this conference. I am delighted for three very specific reasons. First of all, I looked at the program, today program, the list of participants and the resource persons, which gives me an idea that this seminar is a very serious one. It is very good resource persons, very good participants. And I am expecting that as a result of your deliberations, something serious, something <laughs> useful will emerge for the implementation of the policy currently being finalized. The second reason for my being delighted is that I am able to meet a large number of my colleagues whom I had known for several years. We are running out of time, so I will not list the names of all the people because there are so many whom I have met. And, uh, uh, it is a pleasure to meet them again at this conference. The third reason is that we are meeting at a time when implementation is going to be the main key. Till now we have been deliberating on the policy, different ideas, different committees, so many things have come, but now the time for action and we are meeting at a very crucial time. It is not too late to even change some of the recommendations because policy actually gets implemented, when it gets implemented, it undergoes certain changes. In the 70s, I was in the ministry, 1970s, I was in the Ministry of Education, working with Professor J.P. Nayak and Professor Nurul Hassan, when the Kothari Commission recommendations were implemented. Please remember that the policy was in 1968 and the implementation took as many as three years. 71, yes. when 10 plus 2 plus 3 pattern, 3 language formula, all this really got implemented. It went out of negotiations, <coughs> compromises, adjustments, but ultimately a consensus was evolved and that enabled the implementation of the policy successfully. So implementation is the difficult challenge. Now, I, we are running slightly behind schedule. I will not take too much of your time, but in my paper, which will be circulated to you, I have highlighted some of the important challenges that lie in implementation of the policy. The first and most important challenge, important challenge as I look at the policy is that of consolidation. India is very unique among the all countries of the world in having a very large number of institutions with small enrollments. 15,000 institutions are there in this country. The policy emphasizes that these 15,000 institutions will be transformed into many much fewer institutions with large enrollments of at least 3,000 students in each some of them with 20,000, 30,000 students. That's so it, it is envisioning a different kind of a scenario. Now changing from the present to this kind of a new scenario will be a very difficult challenge. And therefore the policy quietly says it will be up in 2040 that you will see it fully realized. So they also understand that it is not going to be an easy process, but this consolidation into large campuses, large colleges, universities, etc. is a must because behind this comes the second challenge. The first challenge is of consolidation, which is a difficult process which will require a lot of investment also in physical infrastructure and other facilities. 
but it is necessary because of the second challenge, which is the academic challenge of transforming the learning. Transform the learning how? How multidisciplinary universities and colleges. Um, encouragement of investment in the field of education. Thank you very much. And we have been struggling through the colleges. The colleges have been struggling. The forum was actually formed to help colleges, to organize principles of colleges, to develop leadership of principles. And there has been, I will say, significant contribution. And one of the one of the proof of this significant contribution is that out of the NAG accredited colleges in the country, 60% of the accredited colleges belong to the ICF. Belong to the ICF. And they come for accreditation. Now there is no time. I would like to apprise my colleagues from the colleges that what you have seen today here is a galaxy of uh, speakers from the rest and you will see many more in the afternoon and tomorrow. I, I, I used to say that when a person comes to the conference he prepares a paper. You have an assessment how many time how much time you take in preparing that paper, how many days. When you hear a speaker, what he speaks, he also contributes, he also uses a lot of his time to prepare that paper. And the experience which we have on the dais today is uh, voluminous, is creditable. I I am not a literary student, I cannot use so good words. But you can see in sight we study Parampara and Adunikta. Parampara is what it continues to be even in the latest times from the old traditions. Purani cheese lagata chalti rai to parampara bani rati. Adunikta kya hoti hai? जो आज है और अगर परंपरा आज बनी हुई है तो भी आधुनिकता होती है जो परंपरा चलती आती है वो भी आधुनिकता है आपने देखा है कितने सीनियर लोग हैं प्रोफेसर राघवन इज मोर देन एटी इयर्स आई एम ऑल्सो क्रॉसिंग एटी बट मोर देन एटी इयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस एंड द ग्रेटेस्ट प्रॉब्लम इन द एजुकेशन इन हायर एजुकेशन टू बेच फॉर एज आई फील आउट ऑफ माई एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ फिफ्टी एटी एक्टिव फिफ्टी एट ईयर्स इज द पॉलिसी ऑफ इम्प्लीमेंटेशन आई एम रिमाइंडेड ऑफ आर्टिकल इन सम जर्नल रिटर्न बाई प्रोफेसर डी डी शर्मा एट द टाइम ऑफ inauguration of the UGC building. The speakers were the MHR Minister Dr. Mulli Manoj Joshi, the Prime Minister Sri Vatal Vihari Vajpayee, the then UGC Chief and the Secretary UGC. Most of them said what was said when the UGC was established. What Maulana Allah said was said by Murli Manar Joshi. The Secretary UGC then also said almost the same thing. The Chairman also pointed out the same problems. Something different was said only by Atal Vyari This was the narration in that article. And I also feel that most of the problems we are facing today what we talk, what is our problem today? I have been learning, I have been hearing the same since I joined higher education in 1962 as a teacher in a post The same problems and the main problem is the human 
the pollution from the Pantwa stocky, that pollution is there, but the greatest pollution is the mental pollution which we are facing. And the persons are uh, struggling, struggling with it. And these conferences, they are providing us the guidance, they are providing us the way we can uh, deal with all these things. Now, the problem, to, today my job here is to thank the speakers, the organizers. Our first I have had the occasion to be with a lot of very distinguished people including Giri Sharma sir. And uh, in that series I recall Prakash Tandon. And I asked him, what do you say of conferences which talk on the same thing over and over again? Is it worth the time? And he said, my dear fellow Vinay, you don't understand. It at least keeps the issue alive. So my compliments to Sharmaji for keeping certain issues alive and never letting us forget that unless you take care of them, he is going to keep us reminded, keep working at it. Dr. Sharma and I go long years back and uh, ever since uh, I crossed my barrier and several age barriers have been noted, I am not going to contribute to the list of uh, the octogenarians, but uh, I think uh, uh, D.D. Sharmaji has one major problem. The other day while talking of him, I said, Aap prachar bhiru asmi hai. You, you, you are almost anti-dissemination. You don't believe in propagating. You don't believe in projecting. And this is an era where kuch kijiye ya mat kijiye shor machate rahe. और शोर मचाते मचाते आप विद्वान भी हो जाते हैं विद्वान हो जाते हैं तो दस आदमी जान भी लेते हैं और सुन सर पांच आदमी भी ना जाने आपको पर पिचुएट भी करते हैं शर्मा जी में ये सब दोष है उनकी बहुत तारीफ हुई उनके कुछ दोषों का भी बखान हो जाना चाहिए इससे दिक्कत ये होती है कि बहुत सारे सुझाव जो उनके हैं वो वहां तक नहीं पहुंच पाते जहां तक पहुंचने चाहिए तो मेरा पहला योगदान आज की सवेरे यह है कि हम लोगों को उनके विचारों को प्रसारित और प्रचारित करने में उनको मदद करनी चाहिए डोमेन ऑफ मैनेजमेंट आई आई टॉक ऑफ एक्शन फिलोसफी के बाद तो यहां बहुत सारे लोग कर ही रहे अनलेस वी गेट दी आइडिया टू वेयर इट मैटर्स वी मे नॉट एज वेल टॉक ऑफ इट एंड आई डोंट थिंक इट कैन बी हिज रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ एंड ए ब्रीफ बायोडेटर वॉज रेड आउट ऑफ मी it was a drafted one usually by editors are drafted out by the persons about who you did the bad but i i noticed that somebody had done his own work i believe in pushing an idea to its implementation and persisting with it till it is acted upon now what are the issues we have talked of challenges over and over again let me tell you what i think are three major challenges of indian education and why just indian education of indian growth our allergy to indian standards in everything the benchmark is non indian you want promotion in an educational institution the question is asked have you published in harvard business review who oh, i should have published in harvard business review my, my subject is of no interest to harvard business review and harvard business review is a commercial magazine which prints for its readership no 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 uh, nothing makes an impression more than say when i was in cambridge Go to Cambridge by all means. What problem do I have? Who knows? If you are teaching economics, you may even end up with a Nobel Prize. I have no problem. I will applaud you of a person of Indian origin. And what's wrong with that? But in this nation, where people are shut up, where they have no visa, no green card, no Singapore residency, no, what are you doing with those crores? That's why it's necessary that Indian standards. मानक तरीके से स्थापित किए जाए मेरा थोड़ा सा रोल इसमें रहा है क्योंकि मैं नैक का मेंबर रहा हूं मैं ए आई सी टी के एक्रेडिटेशन काउंसिल का मेंबर रहा हूं मैं चेयरमैन ऑल इंडिया बोर्ड ऑफ मैनेजमेंट एजुकेशन रहा हूं और जो लोग मेरे नाम से परिचित हैं वो ये भी जानते हैं कि नीपा के बोर्ड में बैठा लेकिन इसको किसी ने छूने की हिम्मत नहीं की मैं निवेदन करूंगा जी जी शर्मा जी से इफ यू कुड यूज हिस्स इन्फ्लुएंस 
to make sure at least in publication there are identifiable Indian standards. I this that after I resigned from IIT as Emeritus Chair Professor eight years ago, to move on to KPMG and then Senior Managing Director and the Global Consulting Organization. Currently, I'm working for Tribe. All the things in an honorary capacity. Or आप जितना आज ही बहुत सारी बात करते हैं हर एक बात हम लोगों का किया हुआ है. And yesterday I had called a meeting of all the IIT and IIM directors to ask them only one thing: Can you assist in this mission, which has been allotted 375 crores? to create a culture of value addition to forest producers of India to make it more remunerative for the tribals and create livelihoods for 9% of this country's population. Three institutions came out and I picked up the phone call Mr. Subramanian. Mr. Subramanian said, we will alter this. We will link it to Unna Park. So things are changing in this country. We are here purposefully only if we lend the shoulders to that change. That is the transformation which we need. Baki to aap bhi jante hain, hum bhi jante hain, chhati aap bhi pirte hain, aur yakin maniye kisi se kam chhati pirtne mujhe nahi aata. Aur jahan zaroor hai, mera aasu bhi baal leta. Aakhir, 55 saal se profession mein hu, to kuch to not amki mein bhi karta hoonga. Lekin not amki ke pare. एक चीज जो है जो कि मैंने शर्मा जी से सीखी, if you carry conviction you go farther. I would like to see as an outcome of these deliberations an action plan only three which will last till the next convention and he can't do it alone. We should all lend our shoulders to him. Otherwise we are wasting our time here. No purpose is going to come out. It's nice to meet each meet each other. Let's move a few stones. दूसरी चीज जो मैं आपसे कहना चाहता हूँ वो ये कि जो लोग भारत में छूट गए हैं ये इच्छा लेके कि वो भी माइग्रेट कर गए होते लेट्स क्रिएट वर्किंग कंडीशंस वर्थ वाइल फॉर देम एंड दिस नैनो मॉनिटरिंग मॉनिटरिंग ऑफ ए माइक्रोस्कोप माउंटेड ऑन ए टेलीस्कोप जिसमें आपने ये चिट्ठी विदेश भेजी इंस्टीट्यूशन के पैसे से भेजी तो ये बताइए इसमें जो 72 रुपए लगे आपने किसको चिट्ठी भेजी लो चल पड़ी कहानी आवर Ability to raise irrelevant questions to monitor each other must be put a stop to. The government is not going to do it. We have to do it ourselves. Let us stop using the government as a peg around which we weave all the problems. And at the same time, we are maintaining good relations. Friends, uh, I am requested to speak on transforming higher education in the, for the future and the challenges. I will try to take up four issues for this session in my presentation. The first one is related to the issues of how we can try to reduce the inequalities in higher education. I will come to the point, what do I mean by inequalities? The second issue that I want to see that, how can we make higher education affordable, quality higher education to all? Affordable is a word which will have implications for financing. A third dimension that I would like to say, there is a bit of confusion regarding quality of higher education and relevance of higher education. I want to see them two separately. And the last one that I'll try to touch upon a little bit about the changing modalities of funding for the future of higher education. These are the four elements that I'll try to say. As I always maintain, I am a student of economics and education and I have learned many things from the luminaries sitting here and I acknowledge whatever I make a statement. If the credit is there, it goes to my gurus and if there is a mistake, you have every right to cut it. Friends, let me start by saying that one of the unique features of 20th century, 21st century is that what we consider it to be a depressed economic growth or a negative economic growth that was experienced by many of the developing countries has dramatically changed the situation of positive economic growth. Even the least developed countries of Africa raised a growth of 4.5 to 5 percent. This is a dramatic change. Another dramatic change that has taken place is in higher education. What you find that the highest rates of growth in higher education took place in this century. 
in 2000 globally there were only 100 million students today in the last 18 years or 17 years to be more specific we have around 220 million students in higher education which means that there was a net addition of 1.7 million students to the higher education sector this is a dramatic achievement and if we put India into the picture of this global change that you are talking about, expansion that you are talking about, massification that you are talking about, what we find is that India started with an 8.3 billion students in 1999-2000. Today we have 38 million, that is what the unpublished latest figure that shows, which means that around 1.6 million was added every year. That means 21% of the global growth in higher education, net addition to higher education, was contributed by India. This is a massive expansion that takes place. When massification takes place and the system expands, there are three situations. One is that inequality indicators may be increasing. When you say that inequality indicators are, indicators are increasing, it means indirectly that the benefits of expansion is going to the rich. The second situation is that indicators of inequality may be remaining the same which means that the rich and the poor are equally benefited. The third situation is that inequality indicators will be declining. That is the time when we are taking higher education to the masses. That is the time we are taking higher education to the poor. My point is that many a time in many countries, massification has taken place without taking higher education to the masses. One good indicator of this is that if you take the per student expenditure of higher education, in the developed countries, you will find that per student expenditure in higher education is perhaps half of the per capita income of that country. Whereas in the developing countries, what you find is that the per capita per student expenditure in higher education is more than doubled, sometimes three times, sometimes four times. In some of the African countries, it's eight times more than that of the per capita income of the country. This shows that we have not massified higher education, we have not expanded higher education to take higher education to the masses. You know. So that is a change that we want to see. So massification has taken place, but who are the beneficiaries of massification is an important dimension that is to be analyzed. And that is where I like to get into inequality, issues in higher education growth. It is a fact that if you look into regional inequalities, it has widened, something which is unbelievable. Sometimes it is seemingly conflicting situation in, the, in terms of the empirical analysis that you find is that the regional inequalities in India has widened while massification is taking place. If you see, example, if you take Bihar, you will find that eight higher education institutions per 100,000 population. If you take Bengal, you will find that 11 higher education institutions for one lakh population. But if you go to Telangana, you will find that it is 58. If you go to Puducherry, you will find that it is 55. So, so on, so on. Which means that five times to six times more institutions concentration in, this place, in these places. <clears throat> Second, if you take the gender inequalities, what one finds is that gender inequalities have a tendency to narrow down. And one unique feature in higher education that we find is that, unlike the school education, whether it is primary or secondary education, what we find is that what we call as a gender parity index, gender parity in higher education is achieved at lower levels of GER than at the school level. My hypothesis when I was working in IIT Paris was that if you reach a GER rate of 25 to 30 percent, you will find that in most cases the GPI, <coughs> gender parity index or equality will be more than one, greater than unity. That's a hypothesis that I developed in the 1990s and changed and empirically validated with other. So this is narrowing down. If you take the social inequalities, I cannot say that there was no change. There is a positive change, but that change is marginal and that is contributed basically by the quota systems that we have or the reservation policies that we have. Let's say that the single largest group who has benefited from the fast expansion of higher education in India <coughs> is the other backward classes, <coughs> more than the general categories. 36% and 42%, and the OBCs grew at the cost of the general category, you know, whereas others, it was a fixed quota system that was in existence. Therefore, there is a lot of change that you find, social inequalities, 
and also you find the different categories. But what is more important for us when we talk about the future are the next two types of inequalities that I would like to highlight. The first inequality is the economic inequality that you talk about. If you go by the gross enrollment ratio in higher education by the quintiles, the lowest 20% of the people, you find that sent 5% of their children to the higher education institutions. Whereas the highest 80% you find that they sent more than 62 to 63% of their children, age group children are in the higher education institutions. <clears throat> this is the place where you find a substantial inequality and a growing inequality if you between, go between different analysis data sources, especially if you compare between 2007 and 2014. Adequate attention is not paid to this. What is also important in the Indian caste and society is to look at this intercorrelation between these two dimensions. Whether you belong to an SC community or an ST community or an OBC community or a general community, your behavior depending upon the which quantile of income you belong to are more or less comparable. And this is a very important dimension. It is not by birth, it is also by the economic circumstances that decides your future opportunities and probabilities to go for higher education. <clears throat> the future question is that can we change this? What actions are needed to change this? Second related dimension of this whole change that you are talking about today. The inequalities are not between those people who are inside the system and outside the system. The inequalities are between the students who are within the system. So for example, somebody in IIT, somebody in IAM, or somebody in the elite institutions, they have a different profile. Not only while they study, also after they study. Okay, so 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 the second diamond second change that I am talking about is this change that we find in terms of the the distance between, widening distance between the students after the end of the system. Unfortunately, in India we have very limited experience or empirical evidence that is generated to about students who, what happens to them after the end of the system. CTR actually conducted a study. Dr. Malish is around here. <coughs> he was the author of that study. We try to do that, what happens to the students once they enter into the system. So that is one dimension and we find that. So, for example, even in IIT, you, yesterday, uh, last week there was a news item that one girl from IIT got 1.2 crores. But from the same IIT, from the same uh, classes, you will also find who got only 3 lakhs or 4 lakhs or 10, uh, 10 lakhs, you know. This variation that we find, not only in, in terms of the cognitive development that is taking place, not, in, not only in terms of the scores that are obtained, but also because of the affective traits which are unbiased by the students and the eliteness of the character that is attained by the students in the process of education that also contributes substantially to the labor market performances. The third dimension, which is very important in India, is about the language issue. It can be a very sensitive issue, but the language, English is the language of the elite. And all best performing institutions are elite institutions, and English is the medium of instruction. <coughs> so the transition from school to higher education institutions becomes very, very difficult. And even if you get admission, it becomes very difficult for you to follow the text. And therefore, one of the major problems in India is that in higher education institutions, especially in the undergraduate colleges, there is no language in which you can transact the curriculum because people coming from different language background, vernacular language, local language, and we don't have a national language. And in this context, you find that it is very difficult. And those who come out of the system, and those who become, get into elite jobs, are the people who speak English, who English is the last, become the language of profession. And that is the one, I'm not propagating for English language, but this is an empirically founded reality that we have to admit and agree. So what happens to the students, that is where 
the next stage of inequality in higher education. What can we do to reduce this inequality rather than the inequalities in getting into the system? India has succeeded very much in the last decades in bringing students to the higher education system, but we have not succeeded adequately to make them equally in terms of learning outcomes, equality in terms of the learning outcomes and also employment outcomes. So the other is promotion of private institutions. One has to make a distinction between the two. And today the whole discussion is centered around both these things mixed. So when you are talking about uh, partnership or even, even when we talk about cost recovery measures of strengthening education institutions, we are talking about privatization of public institutions where the management and the funding partially or substantially remains in the government. But it is the market principles are made the operational principles of institutional performance in such institutions. So one has to make a distinction between the two. Now when we talk about public-private partnership, there are different ways in which it is tried. Some corporate entities are individually entering into higher education. Some of them, are, uh, the basic difference between the capitation fee colleges of the 1980s and 90s and the universities which are coming up now, the basic difference is that the universities are established by corporate sectors, whereas capitation fee colleges were not established by the sectors. And if you look at from the economic point of view, what one finds is that the well-established or established universities may take 10 or 15 years to recover the cost and profit. It's a long-term investment. Whereas in the cavitation fee colleges, everybody was looking into what the term that is economics use is quid pro quo. So the